What's up, friends? Good to see you. Um, it's great to have you with us. If you are a first-time guest with us at Stone Point, hey, we're so glad to have you and uh, look forward to getting to, to meet you if we haven't already. I want to welcome those that are joining us on the Edgewood campus as well as the, those that are joining us online. Uh, we've got a, a lot of uh, passing in the night over the next couple of weeks. Got uh, some people that are enjoying spring break. Wills Point uh, is out this coming up week. Uh, the following week, we've got other schools uh, in the area like uh, Canton and uh, Edgewood and Grand Saline uh, all out. And so uh, we're going to obviously be on lots of different trips and so uh, and probably some excursions and a few days away. And so we hope that your time is restful if you are getting away. And if you're like the rest of us, just going to keep working, um, hey, then, you know, bless your heart. Uh, <clears throat> But uh, today we're going to continue uh, our series in Romans. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there as we continue to look at the character and, and uh, really the, just the revealing nature of God and His righteousness. And if you have your Bibles and, and, and want to turn with me to Romans chapter 8, we're going to be looking at a, a text today uh, that is going to encourage our hearts. No matter where you are in the room, uh, no matter uh, what you came in uh, with the expectation of, there's no way that you can leave today and not have your hearts encouraged through God's Word. It's just one of those texts that a pastor wishes he could teach every single week because in some ways it encourages everyone, and it's one of those fitting texts that's just it's, it's easy to teach. Uh, and, and so it's a fantastic text, um, and they're not all like that. So let's enjoy it today. Um, as I think about this text, I'm reminded of a story of, uh, of a monk and uh, his monastery that he had had built. And uh, it was for, obviously, lots of different monks. And uh, what they would do is they would leave civilization to get away. And so this particular one was in Portugal. It was nestled up on, on kind of a, uh, a really steep crevice or a mountain uh, area. It was about 3,000 foot above everything else. And it was a very difficult a uh, treacherous way to get there. Well, once they had gotten there and built it, what they did is they took a rope and stretched it across uh, thousands of foot of ravine, and they, they weaved them together a big basket, and then they hooked it to that rope, and they would pull people over through that basket. And so that's how a monk would get to the monastery across the other side. Well, there was a particular American that was there, and he wanted to go and sightsee and see the monastery for himself. And so he loaded up in the basket on the other side, and sure enough, there were three monks on the other side pulling as vigorously as they could this American across the way. As the American's going across the way, he realizes that, that the rope is a little bit shriveled and that it's actually it's, it's kind of old and, it, and, and it's kind of breaking in several different places, in which at that point he's about halfway through the ravine and his heart, as he kind of shakes back and forth in this basket, begins to beat at a different level. Sure enough, he gets to the other side and as he does, he asks the lead monk, he goes, hey, what do you do with this rope? Like, how often do you replace it? He goes, oh, just when it breaks. <laughs> Isn't that awesome, reassuring? And that, I think, is how oftentimes we think about different things. But this text today is to remind you that you don't have to worry, like this American going across the ravine, that there is a God in heaven who has you, and even when life breaks... He's still got you in the palm of his hand. And that's what the text is today. Matter of fact, in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, Paul asks the question to the church in Rome. He says, what then shall we say to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, this is a really important verse. And it's one that if you haven't ever memorized, you should. And it's really easy to memorize because you're just asking a question. What then shall we say to this? And then you make a statement. If God is for us, who can be against us? And this whole idea here is being built off of what we've already seen in Romans chapter 8. Matter of fact, in Romans chapter 8, uh, in verse 1, it just talks about there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In verse 28, it talks about that God is working all things together for the good of those who love him. So you take those two verses together, put them together like a sandwich, and then you've got this incredible picture in verse 31 of, hey, what then shall we say? If God is for us, then who can be against us? If God is the one who says there's no condemnation for us, and God is the one who's using all things to work out things together for our own good, 
then what is there to fear? What, what is there to worry about? What is there to be anxious about? And yet here it is, as believers in America, we tend to be as anxious or fretful as the rest of the population. We tend to struggle with things like anxiety or fear or restlessness. And the question is, is why? If God is for us, then what should you fear? If God is for you, who's against you? And that's what Paul is going to build a case for as he continues through Romans. Matter of fact, in verse 32, look what he says. He, meaning God, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So he asks the question. He goes, if you've got God in heaven who, who did not spare his own son but gave, and he uses this word there in the Greek, which is a, a word paradidomi, which literally means that he delivered him over. That's the word. Matter of fact, in your Bible translation, depending on which one, it may not say he gave, but it may say he delivered him over. He delivered him over for us, meaning that he was willing to subject himself and his son to the wrath of God for us. He delivered his son up so that we might, what? Have all things through his grace. That's an incredible hope. It reminds me of Genesis chapter 22, the story of Abraham. And Abraham was asked by God to sacrifice his son. And so he takes his son up the mountain willingly, is going to give up his son Isaac on behalf of God. He's going to deliver him over in obedience to God. Now we know that God spared Isaac and provided a ram in the thicket. But listen, not for his own son. His own son asked the question in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, may there be any other way that this cup could pass from me, but not my will, but thy will be done. What we see here in Romans chapter 8 is that God says, hey, I love you so much, meaning us, those of us who believe, that he was willing to subject his son to wrath and vengeance and hurt and pain and ultimately death so that he would graciously give us, the believer, all things through Christ. That's awesome. Like, that's super incredible to know that God loved us that much. There are a multitude of texts that could support it, but probably the most fitting is just going back a few chapters. In Romans chapter 5, let's look at verses 8 through 11, just remind ourselves what Paul said to the church of Rome. If you remember uh, in in verse 8, it just talks about that God demonstrated his love for us in this. What That what? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Then it goes in in verse 9 and says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Now here's what this text is saying. It is saying there was a time in which you were dead in your trespasses. You were sinners, right? Uh, We were alienated. We were estranged. We were orphans. Paul would make the case that we were enemies of God. So you, you were living in darkness. And then here it is, Christ demonstrated his love that he gave himself for us, that he willingly subjected himself to his father's authority. He comes to earth. He identifies with sinful man. He was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he was without sin. He willingly goes to the cross. He literally hangs on a cross in the place of a criminal. You and I are the criminal. The reason why is because we are sinful. We are wretched. Our hearts are darkened. We're deceitful. We're sinful. And yet here it is, Christ died so that we could be reconciled to God. That there could be a transfer that takes place is what he's talking about. And so you and I are no longer have to be aliens, orphans, and strangers. Why? Because we can now be sons and daughters with an inheritance. We can be heirs to our Father in heaven. That's awesome news. We no longer have to be enemies of God because now we can become his friend. We no longer have to live in darkness because now we can walk and live in the light of truth. Do you see the difference? 
That's what Paul is telling the church of Rome. And ultimately, that's our encouragement today. Hey, what then shall we say to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Like, let me ask you a question. If God in heaven is the one who meets all and ultimately makes all the demands of righteousness, and really that's the key here is the demands of righteousness. If he's the one who makes the demands of righteousness, but he also satisfies his own demands of righteousness through his son, who is who is to be the one to bring a charge against his own righteousness? Think about that. Because ultimately what God has done is set a demand. And his demand and his expectation of righteousness is that no one enters into his presence if you're sinful. Make sense? He's perfect in every way. He's got these legal demands in which he has made and ultimately is willing to meet. And he meets it by sending his son in the likeness of sinful man to take on our sin so that as he takes on our sin, he can then in turn give us his righteousness. And as he does that, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, we are now heirs, friends, children of light, and ultimately no one can make a charge against what God has said is true of you. Make sense? Matter of fact, look what verse 33 says. That's Paul's point. So Paul says, look, who can be against you if God's for you? Look at what God's done. He's given you all things through his son. Graciously, he has supplied you with all you need. Verse 33 then says, so who shall bring any charge against God's elect? And Paul asks the question, who can accuse you? Who, who is it that can come against you and make a claim against God? Because that's the question. Now, listen, do you have accusers? Absolutely. Do you have people that are going to make accusations against you? Yes. Matter of fact, we also know that the Bible speaks candidly that there is an accuser. We would call him Satan. We know that he's got cohorts and uh, we've, he's got others that would love to conspire with him in bringing accusations against the believer. It would please Satan and all of his adversaries with him to get you isolated, alone, estranged, weak, volatile, spinning in confusion. Uh, it would please him to do that. But what Paul is saying is this. There is nothing, there is no one that can bring a charge against God's elect. Meaning that if God has declared you righteous, not because you are righteous, but because his son was righteous on your behalf, if, if he's already settled the score because you put your faith in the person and the work of Jesus, then Paul says, who can take that away from you? So let me liken it to this. At the end of the night, you've got a cash register and you've got an employee who's worked that cash register all day and they know uh, what's happened. They've, they've given receipts. Uh, they know when somebody actually owed two pennies and somebody else put it in on their behalf. But at the end of the day, what they're going to do is they're going to reconcile that account, and they're going to make sure that that cash register balances out. They want to make sure that they know what they started with and what they ended with. Friends, that's Paul's point here. Paul is saying, listen, the score was never settled, until Christ came and he died. And when he died in your place, and ultimately you trusted in him, Christ took upon all your sin, all your, your dilemmas, all your challenges, all your darkness, all of your strange, weird idiosyncrasies, all the things that you have going against you, Christ takes on, and then he takes and supplies with you a banner of righteousness. And what he does is on your personal account, he settles the score. He takes the receipt and he balances it out. And so his point, his point is, if Christ has settled the score, then who can come and make an accusation against you? And Paul says, no one. No one. The adversary doesn't have a place because Christ is the one who's supreme. He then goes on and he makes the case at the uh, end of 33, he says, and it's God who justifies. So if no one else can make an accusation because God alone is the judge, then he goes, you just need to know it's God who justifies. It's God who makes right. He goes on and asks the question in verse 34, then who is to condemn? And he says, 
Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is the right hand of God, who is interceding for us. And what Paul does is this. He says, look, if God is for you, who can be against you? He says, no one, because Christ died for you. And if Christ died for you, he's reconciled all things. The account is in order. It's made straight. It's right. And he goes, and then beyond that, let me give you four reasons why. And right there in verse 34, he gives you four reasons and why you can trust that God is supreme. And he goes, number one is because Christ Jesus is the one who died. Now, when you think about Christ Jesus being the one who died, the question is, is why did he die? It's because it pleased God to stricken his son, Isaiah 53, on our behalf. So Christ dies. And when he dies, he, he removes our guilt, he removes our shame, and ultimately he reconciles us back to God, Romans 5. But it doesn't stop there. He goes, and more than that, he was the one who was raised. So Christ doesn't just die, but he also is raised. Now look, was he raised on the first day? Second day? No, the third day he raised from the dead. And when he raised from the dead, do you know what happens? He disarms all the rulers, all the principalities, and all the powers of the dark world. Now think about this. The enemy believed wholeheartedly that they had Jesus, the one who claimed to be the Son of God. They, he was crucified. If you could imagine, probably in the dark world, in Hades, there was lots of rejoicing. He's dead. God's Son, the one who claims to be divine, is, is dead. We got him. And through the hands of sinful and wicked men, we, we got him. The problem was, is that it wasn't wicked and sinful men that got him. And this is huge in your theology. Pay very close attention. Wicked and sinful men didn't get him. You, I, didn't put him there. So it's, it's a fallacy to believe, oh, well, I, my sin put him on the cross. No, you, here, here's very important. God, in his righteousness, knows that there is no one who has authority like he does. And so he takes his son and he puts him on the cross. And it is, he is pleased to bring about his vengeance. He is pleased to bring about his wrath. And he is pleased to bring about his destruction on his own son. He willingly takes his son, the one who is in his likeness, and places him on the cross to meet his own demands. So what is the demands of God? Perfect righteousness. Who meets the demands? His son Jesus. Why does he put Jesus there? Because Jesus is the only one who fits the bill. And in order to reconcile a bunch of sinful people like us to himself, he has to put his son on the cross. Now, does he use people in that process? Absolutely. Do people think they're more powerful than they are? Absolutely. But just let's be clear. God put his son on the cross to meet his own demands so that wicked people might go free. And so look. When he dies, it is Christ who meets his own demands. Or it's, it's, uh, when he dies, it is God who meets his own demands through his son Christ. When he's resurrected, it is mocking the dark world. It, it, it is saying, you have not held anything down. They, they single-handedly disarm all the rulers, all the principalities of the dark world. We'll see that in a second. But it doesn't stop there. He says, and now he's at the right hand of God, verse 34. So he doesn't just die and raised again, but now he's at the right hand of God. Philippians 2, why is he at the right hand of God? Because he was given the name above all names. Because of his willingness to subject himself to his own father's wrath, because of his willingness to take on the sin of the world and ultimately drink the cup of wrath, it pleased God to give him the name above all names. The name in which our calendar revolves around. The name in which you and I, when we hear we can't help but be mesmerized by. It's the name of Jesus, the name above all names. But not only that, look at, he is not only at the right hand of God in power, but what's he doing? He's, he's there, indeed, interceding for us, which is really cool. To know that, that Christ, God's Son, not only came to forgive us of sin and ultimately bestow upon us righteousness and honor and sonship, to make us heirs, but he's also interceding on our behalf, which means 
that he is working all things together for the good of those who love him, interceding. When we don't see the things that are good, he's interceding. He's using all things for his glory and our good in our life, which is really encouraging. And that's the premise of the text. It is God who justifies, so who has the ability to condemn? No one. Who has the ability to bring a charge against God? No one. Why? Because God is in charge. He is the one who is supreme. He's the one working things out. We can trust him. Why? Because he has all power. Power to, to, to bring punishment to his son. Power to raise his son from the dead. Power to give him a name above all names. Bestow honor on him. Put him at the right hand of God. Power to use him as he fulfills his purpose, even as he um, intercedes on our behalf. That's really good news. Now, when I think about all these legal demands and all that God is doing, disarming the powers, the rulers, the authorities, where do I get that from? Where do we even get that idea? Well, if you've been reading along with us in Colossians chapter 2, you're about to stumble upon it. Here it is. Look at Colossians 2, verses 13 through 15. It just says this, And you, who were dead in your trespasses, Paul's writing to the church of Colossae. I think you could apply this to your lives too if you're a believer. It says, And the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses, then look, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross, and he disarmed the rulers and the authorities, and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So in Christ, he reconciles sinful men to himself. In Christ... He bestows honor and glory to his own son in Christ when he's raised from the dead and ascends to the right hand of the Father. He disarms all, all of the authorities and the principalities of the dark world. Oh, we got him. We got him. Oh, wait a second. We don't have him. And that's the hope that we have in Christ. And that's the hope that Paul is trying to help you and I understand. Now, why is he saying this, of this magnitude? Why is he helping us realize that it's in Christ that we have all these things? Well, it's because he wants you to know that if Christ is the one who brings about all of these purposes, then who has the authority to separate you from Christ? So if somebody, if somebody brings, his, brings a charge against you, they don't have the authority to do that. Um, they don't have the authority to condemn you. So then Paul goes, so do they have the authority to separate you from the love of God? And he answers the question. So in verse 35, he goes, question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Is there anybody? Is there anything? Is there anything that could separate you from Christ? I'll go ahead and add this question, including yourself. Is there anything, anyone? And that's really the question. That, so are you going to have challenges? Are you going to have disagreements? Are you going to have um, difficulties? Absolutely. But what Paul is saying here is, he goes, listen, if there's no one that can bring an accusation or charge against you, if there's no one who can condemn you, then the question is, is who can separate you? And that's his point. He's just saying, look, if you think about what Christ has done, if there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ, if Christ is working all things together for the good of those who love him, if he's interceding on your behalf because of what he's done at the cross, then he goes, who, who's in control? Is it the enemy that's in control? Is it you that's in control? And the answer is the enemy's not in control and you're not in control. There is only one who is supreme. There is only one who has all authority. His name is God the Father and he is pleased to give that authority to his son. Make sense? Which is why his son Jesus even tells his disciples in John um, chapter 10, this famous passage where Jesus is talking about being the good shepherd. Um, look what he says in John chapter 10, verse 27 and following. Now, the reason I share this is because John shares the signs of the times and what, what really ultimately he, he just tells you about who Christ is. John, the apostle, he doesn't just write this book. He writes 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He also writes the book of Revelation. So John has a lot of insight as to what God is doing. But here he records the words of his own master, Jesus, and look what Jesus says regarding the whole theme of shall we be separated from the love of Christ. Look what Jesus says. Jesus says in verse 27, he says, my sheep hear my voice, and he says, and I know them, and they follow me. Verse 28, he says, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Verse 29, he says, my father 
who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And then he answered the question, because I and the Father are one. So Jesus says, look, I'm not doing anything that's outside of my Father's will because I and the Father work together. We are one. And he goes, and what you need to know is if you are my sheep, you'll not only hear my voice, you'll obey, you'll follow me. And he goes, and if I am your master and you are my sheep, he goes, I have you in the palm of my hand and there is nothing that can snatch you away. And he goes, and more than that, he goes, you're in my Father's hand and there is nothing that can snatch you out of my Father's hand. Really what I see there is double coverage, right? Right? And so that's a really incredible and helpful text that just supports what Paul is saying. Hey, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who can bring a charge against God's elect? Hey, who can condemn you? Hey, who can separate you from the purposes of God? Because no one. There's no authority under heaven and earth that is greater than our great God which then he adds a handful of scenarios after he asked that question. What shall separate from the love of God? And then he asked the question, should it be tribulation? I mean, Paul had tribulation. He endured. Should it be distress or maybe persecution? Or maybe it's famine or nakedness or maybe it's danger or sword? He goes, which one is it? He goes, people persecute you for the sake of Christ? He goes, is that enough? You go through perilous times. You have a diagnosis that seems difficult. And even in that diagnosis, you ask the question, God, have you abandoned me? God, why have you stricken me this way? God, God, where are you? You don't seem to be near. You grow up in a home that's broken and in shambles. You you lose a, a parent at a very young age. And you go, God, where are you? Why did I grow up like this? Why don't I have the family that everybody else has? Why is my family so different? And all these questions, it almost seems like, oh, we know who Christ is. We know he died for us, but why me? God, why did I get cheated? God, why am I the one who got ripped off? God, why was I the one who endured such hardship? And here's Paul saying, listen, if you've endured tribulation, if you've endured persecution, if you've endured disease, if you've endured famine or peril or hardship, if you've endured abuse, It is your heavenly Father saying, listen, I understand. I get it. Now listen, that's not my word saying, hey, I understand. I I think God understands what you're enduring. I think that's why he sent his son, the one who was stricken by his own father. Been abandoned by a father? Jesus identifies. Been abused? Jesus knows. Been reviled? Hard things said about you? Things that weren't true? Jesus gets it. And he goes, and in all that, you just need to know it will not separate you from the love of God. Wow! All the things I've endured, all the things you've endured, your heavenly Father knows And he sent his son to identify with you in every way plausible. In every way, not just taking on your sin, but also identifying and understanding even the most difficult things you will endure on earth. Jesus understands. And so I just want you to know that whatever it is, Christ gets it. And it will not separate you from the love of Christ. Reminds me of a story. There were a bunch of botanists that went up into the Alps. They were looking for a new uh, handful of breeds of, of flowers and these unique things, you know, that they you know had heard about but never really seen or had their hands on. And so uh, they're on kind of a couple of week exploration through the Alps, going to different villages in which they come to this one really treacherous peak, and they're looking down into a ravine and they they spot these rather rare flowers through binoculars. The dilemma is is that it's rather deep gorge, and in order to get to it, somebody's going to have to be lowered. They look around. They've got rope, but they don't have a willing participant uh, because they're all too heavy. Um, And so they decide, well, maybe we'll walk back up to the village, see if we can get one of these youngsters to to agree, slip them a little money or something, and and they'll be willing. So sure enough, they come across uh, this, this young man, probably eight or nine years old, go, hey, man, would you be willing to be 
lower down into the ravine to get some flowers for us, bring them back up. We'll pay you a little extra money. And the boy's like, I don't know. I mean, so they go and they look at it, they check it out. And sure enough, the, the boy looks down. He's like, that really is a long way. He's like, we're going to put a rope around you. We'll secure you really tight. And all of us men are going to grab hold. We'll lower you. Once you get them, we'll bring you back up. And he's a little bit hesitant, but also a little bit exuberant. Like, oh, I could do it. But he goes, hey, I'll be right back. And so he leaves. About 15 minutes later, he comes back and he's got an older man with him. And uh, he just says, okay, guys, I'm ready. Just make sure that this guy right here has a part of the rope. He goes, this is my dad. And, and that's the point. Like, you, you can understand. Like, hey, as long as dad's near, as long as dad has a part of the rope, hey, we can do this. But you better make sure he's, because I trust my dad. That's Paul's point. You can trust your heavenly father who has your best interest at heart. There's no condemnation in him. He's working all things together for the good of those who love him, even the hard things. And there's nothing that will separate you, even the difficult, even the strenuous, even the things that make you question whether or not he's near. It will not separate you from the love of God. Wow, what an encouraging text. Which is why we can even have hope in verse 36 as he says, as it's written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. Which doesn't really seem all that fitting in this text, right? Right? Because you're like, okay, I'm so encouraged. Nothing separates us from the love of God. And then he goes, as it's written, for your sake, we're being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And he literally goes and he quotes Psalm 44, 22 verbatim. If you go to Psalm 44, 22, it's going to be exactly what you see there. And the reason he does that, though, is because suffering has always been a part of, of righteousness. It, it's always been a cup that believers have to drink. Now, in our time, we don't understand that quite as well as a Paul or a Peter would have. But what I want you to realize is that that was true. Matter of fact, let me show you Acts chapter 5, verse 41, just real quick. It just says, and this was about the apostles. The apostles uh, were there. Uh, God's doing all kinds of things in the early church. And then they're beaten, okay, and then released and told not to ever preach again. And this is their response. Acts 5, verse 41, it says, Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. They had just been beaten, and then they leave, and they go, Hey, what shall we say to this? God is for us. Who can be against us? Is that your response? What shall separate you? Beatings? Hardship? Persecution? Nope. Nothing will separate us from the love of Christ. That's their response, which is really cool. You, you remember, that's why Jesus says these words in John chapter 16. You remember, uh, he's getting ready to go away, preparing his disciples for things to come. And he just says, hey, behold, verse 32, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone. So he goes, you're going to be moved, displaced, different place. He goes, you're going to leave me alone. Jesus says, but yet, not, yet I'm not alone, for the Father is with me. And then he says this, verse 33, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. What does that mean? He means I have triumphed. I will triumph over all things. Life and death. Matter of fact, he tells you what he's triumphing over in verse 38. Here it is. And we'll conclude uh, in, in uh, 38 here in a second. But let's read 37 first. He says, no, in all things we are more than conquerors, right? Through him who loved us. When he uses that word conquerors, he uses the Greek word that literally means overcoming uh, conqueror or one who has surpassing victory. So he goes, you are more than a conqueror through him who loved us. Why? Because Christ has overcome the world. And because he's overcome the world, there's nothing that separates you from the love of Christ. Verse 38, he says, and this is what I'm convinced of. Paul says, for I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, right? Nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now look at that. That's a list of good and bad. Death nor life, angels, rulers, present, things that you don't see to come, powers, principalities, whatever, height, depth. He goes, it doesn't matter. Why? Because you're in the palm of your master's hand. And I don't know about you, that helps me go out and have a really good spring break. You know why? Because here's the deal. Every spring, 
I'm reminded of a few things. One, I'm reminded that there is a process in the world in which God governs and is in control of. I am reminded that all things are subjected to him, even creation itself. And here in the next few weeks, what you're going to see is this. You're going to see flowers begin to bud. You're going to have trees that begin to bloom. And when you see that, you can just be reminded, just as the Jew was, that the spring rains are just around the corner. And when the spring rains fall and your crops are provided for, you're reminded that if Christ can provide for the lilies of the field and he'll tell you he'll provide for the birds of the air, then how much more will he care for you and I? That, that if he feeds everything in creation, why, why won't he feed us? Why won't he take care of us? And he will. And what's incredible is, is that not only we see this process in which all things are under God's authority and we see his provision, but even more than that, we are reminded that even though the dead of winter was not too long ago and when things were not budding to life and things seemed to be dead and bleak and cold, that you can just remind yourself, just in the days of Narnia, no matter how long the winter might last, there is always a spring around the corner. And that is why we trust in Christ, because he is our conqueror. And he makes us more than conquerors in him who loved us and gave himself up for us so we might bring him glory and that we might do much good in the world. And we might remind one another, even though your life right now is in the dead of a cold, harsh winter, you need to know that on the other side of the ravine, there's a rope that won't break. And there are flowers that will bloom. And more than that, God's in control of it all. And he's worthy. And I just hope that you'll know that just on the other side. And you go, well, okay, but what if, what if my other side's not here? Then I would say, to glory be to God. Because Paul says, listen, to depart and be with the Lord is better by far. And listen, there are many of us who hurt and have pain because there are people who aren't with us. And listen, even that won't separate you from the love of Christ. Why? Because even in the dead of your cold winter, you need to know there is a spring and there is a day in which you'll see life again. And it may not be here and it may not be soon, but you need to know that God's promises are true, that he has an inheritance for us, as Peter says, that will not spoil, that will not fade away. And so for that, I say, press on. And long for the spring rain and the rejoicing and the freedom that comes from a spring day. And so if you enjoy a spring day today, may it remind you of what's to come. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth. I thank you, Lord, that you, oh God, are just reminding us that if you're for us, there's nothing that can be against us. Lord, if you gave your own son... And he died by the will of God for the things of God. Who can bring a charge against you? There is no one who stands up against you. We can't bring a charge against you. Job couldn't bring a charge against you. The enemy, the adversary can't bring a charge against you because ultimately you've already met all of your own demands. You sent your son in the likeness of man. He died in our place. He rose again on the third day. He ascended to the right hand of of his father. He intercedes for those he loves. You're working all things out for the good of those who love you. And there's nothing that will separate us from the love of Christ. Lord, thank you for that news. And I pray that as we go throughout our day and through our week, as we go throughout this 2022 year, I pray that as we hear about wars and rumors of wars, as we see distress and persecution and famine and, and challenges, I pray that we would know that you're still in control. And there's nothing that separates us, not death, not life, not angels or demons or rulers or things to come, because there's nothing in creation that will separate us from the love of God in our Lord and in our Christ Jesus. And so we thank you. May you give us hope. May you give us grace. And may you help us to walk near to our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.